Hi, uh, I'm Yi, and this is Surya. We're here to talk about E-Race, uh, a tool for re reverse engineering smart contracts on Ethereum. Um, so first, Ethereum, uh, as we know, is the second largest uh, blockchain-based cryptocurrency. Um, but uh, in addition to regular accounts on the blockchain, uh, Ethereum also features smart contracts. So smart contracts are essentially computer programs, so they can be used for much more advanced functionalities other than simple balance transfer. Oh. Oh. Okay. <laughs> uh, as in regular accounts. Um, so for example, they can be used for uh, auctioning, um, uh, uh, crowdfunding, or even lottery or gambling games, if you wish. So smart contracts are typically written in high-level languages. The most popular language is Solidity, and they're executed in a virtualized environment named the Ethereum Virtual Machine, or just EVM for short. Uh, so here we'll take a look at an example contract. This is a pretty trivial one, uh, but as we see, it's similar to a class uh, in other languages. It has a few, some few variables and a few functions to interact with it. Uh, well, in this case, it only has one, and this will be our running example in our tool. So uh, the problem with the high-level representation is that the EVM cannot directly understand it. So instead, it needs to be compiled into this form. And essentially, this is an encoding of the EVM bytecode, which are low-level operations provided by the Ethereum virtual machine. So as we can see, the problem with the bytecode is that it's not easily understandable. And if the high-level source code is not available, the contract functionality will appear to be opaque to us. And the problem with opaque or proprietary contract is that they are really hard to understand or audit. To have a better understanding of the ecosystem, uh, well, we did some measurement. We, um, at our snapshot, we collected uh, about a million contracts. Uh, there are about a million addresses that contains Ethereum smart contracts. However, we, if we look at the unique ones, we only found 34,000 uh, unique contracts. And by unique, we mean after swarm hash removed. So the second level question will be how many of, of these contracts are actually opaque or proprietary? So to answer that, we scraped Etherscan and collected more than 10,000 Solidity source files. And using 35 different versions of uh, Solidity compilers, uh, which are the major compiler versions available. Uh, we ended up co uh, co compiling 88,000 unique binaries. Uh, so the next step is to take the intersection of these compiled binaries with the ones that we found on the blockchain. We ended up matching 7,700 of the unique contracts, which leaves us the majority, 77% of the contracts without source code available. To actually study and understand these contracts, we built ERAs, where we utilize various program analysis and program transfer techni transformation techniques uh, to translate uh, EVM bytecode into more readable representations. So ERA processes the bytecode in five sequential stages. First, we recover the control flow graph. Then we lift the stack-based operations into a register-based representation. We then optimize upon the derived representation, and afterwards we aggregate our representation into a more compact format, and eventually we recover the control flow constructs from the contract. So first, uh, we recover the control flow graph. This, uh, we start by identifying the basic block boundaries. This is hugely assisted by the jump test instructions, which basically marks uh, the beginning of a block. Then we organize the blocks into a control flow graph. Uh, we essentially emulate the contract execution using a simplified stack model. Uh, we explore the contract in a manner that is similar to D DFS. And we also record the stack images at each block entrance uh, to decide when we should backtrack. Uh, so the algorithm basically works like, as follows. Uh, we start starting from the first block. We analyze the basic block, identify its successors, add the successors to the control flow graph, then recurse on the successor. And this is how we build a CFG. So one major problem with the EVM bytecode is that the operations are stack-based. 
so, which makes it really hard for us to, under, to, to have a, a sense of variables, especially across basic block boundaries. So to address that problem, we convert the representation into a register-based representation. We start by mapping the stack slots into registers. Uh, EVM stack is specified to have a maximum size of 1024. So we introduce 1024 registers accordingly. Uh, then uh, the next step is to assign appropriate registers for each of the bytecode. Here we show an example of an add operation. So in the current configuration, the stack height is three. So the add operation will pop to items of the stack, add them up, and push the value back on. So this is equivalent of reading register S1, S2, and put, add them up and put the value back into S1. <laughs> the same method could be applied to basic blocks as well, as long as we know the stack height at the, at the block entrance. Um, as we mentioned previously, we collect the stack images at each block entrance, which makes this information readily available. And here we showed an example of a block being lifted. Another problem with the EVM bytecode is that the operations are relatively low level. So we introduce some new instructions that's slightly higher level so that the output is more concise. These include, for example, int call and int thread, uh, which calls and returns from internal functions um, and move, which moves a constant value or register value to another register. Assert is just like in high level language, asserts condition and not equal, greater than or equal, less than or equal, shift right, left, shift right. Uh, these are the operations that are commonly used in the contracts, but not directly available on the bytecode level. Uh, so in the next step, we, open, we notice that there are a lot of redundancies in our lifted representation. This is mainly due to the stack operations uh, tends to move data around a lot. So to remove the redundancies added by these moving instructions, uh, we use uh, uh, common global optimizations, uh, mainly data flow, which includes constant propagation, copy propagation, uh, dead code elimination. Uh, we also introduce, uh, implement some local optimizations that's customized. For example, in this case, LT and E0 is zero could be rewritten into GEQ and eventually this block could be optimized into just three instructions. <laughs> to, further even, to further condense our output, uh, we aggregate our representation into, an, into nested expressions. So we start by converting the register-based instructions into their three address form. This is merely cosmetic. Then, based on the usages and definitions of the registers, we can aggregate these instructions. So the first one could be aggregated into the third, second one, and could be further aggregated into the third one. And eventually, the whole block could be uh, summarized with only one expression. So having improved all the, the representations in each individual block, we tackle the overall control flow structure. Uh, we start by separating the public functions uh, within a contract. So as we mentioned previously, a contract typically consists of multiple functions, and here we untangle their control flow graph. Then we apply structural analysis on the individual control flow graphs uh, to recover the control flow constructs such as while and if then else. Uh, in this example, we could first collapse uh, the if then else, then uh, these two sequences, then eventually we can match the loop and finally, the whole thing could be collapsed into a single block. And here we have the final output of erase. Having done the transformations, we would like to validate that our output is correct. Uh, to do so, we construct a test case, well, a set of test cases using historical transactions. Um, the idea is that we leverage GEF, the Go implementation of the Ethereum client, to replay these transactions and uh, generate the expected output of these transactions. Then we execute our representation um, well, in the interpreter that we wrote and compare if, if there is any discrepancy uh, between the output. So we ended up collecting a little bit less than 16,000 transactions 
These, are, these transactions are collected on the basis of one per unique contract. Um, and this is less than half of the unique contracts because apparently more than half of them never got any public transactions into them. Uh, we are successful in most cases, uh, but we do fail 3% of them in which a construction failure is a case that we fail to generate any output in the first place. And a comparison failure is um, the case in which our output does not match exactly with the one generated by gas. So now we will have to, get to describe several use cases. All right, thank you. So, so basically now that we have this tool, we wanted to demonstrate its utility through a bunch of use cases. So the first thing we looked at is this thing called a fuzzy hash. So fuzzy hash is essentially over a function. You can calculate the hash over all the basic blocks of the function and compute a hash. So these are fuzzy hashes, for example, of these random functions A, B, C. But now that once you have these hashes, you can find similar instances of these in other contracts where you might not know the actual functionality. So you can imagine if you have a contract binary X whose functionality you already understand, now you can find more instances of the code occurring in other contracts to kind of see where code is reused, and you can understand other contracts just through this methodology. So we also then actually used this to reverse engineer um, a few contracts, an interesting um, you know, blockchain uh, phenomenon happening at the time. So the, so the so basically, the first thing we looked at were opaque contracts that we found that had really large ether bound, right? So the, the, we actually found three, three contracts that are all used by this Ethereum exchange, by an exchange called Gemini on Ethereum, and they hold, held a combined $590 million. So these, co these contracts were actually multi-sig wallets. If you don't know what a multi-sig is, that's basically a signature scheme where, for example, if I want to authorize a transfer or validate or a withdrawal, I need some, some subset of authorized signatures in, in order to make it happen. So two of them, so two of the three that we found implemented a pretty standard two of n multisig signature scheme, but the last one that we found actually had a pretty interesting, more complex time dependent scheme. So the first thing we found actually from you running eways on it is if you see there's an instance of this global variable called block timestamp. So the use of block timestamp instruction anywhere in the code is considered what's called a code smell because it's generally, um, it's generally um, unreliable and can be skewed by miners on Ethereum. Right, so seeing this block timestamp, we chose to reverse engineer and kind of see how the block timestamp is used in the withdrawal policy. So we were able to figure out how it's used exactly the withdrawal policy, and you know this actually shows how useful how useful ERAS is in this example for being able to audit such code, such critical code, where you know we see instances of things like block timestamp or other code smells. Next, we also looked at opaque contracts that were that actually occurred the m most often, right? So we saw in the previous slides that even though there's a million contracts deployed, we only have about 34,000 unique contracts. So we actually found that about we have hundreds of thousands of those contracts are actually um, the instances of the same two contracts. So for their investigation, we found we found that the two exchanges, Poloniex and Yunbi, were actually the ones responsible for deploying all these contracts, and we use ERAs and reverse engineer them up to up to solidity, and we could actually see that they're just simple wallets for ERC20. But nonetheless, this uh, kind of this kind of answered the question that was raised by our, our initial measurement um, of seeing you know, exactly where these contracts are coming from, why there's so many duplicates, and exactly what and how are they operating. Next, we also looked at the phenomenon, uh, phenomenon called um, arbitrage on Ethereum. So, such on Ethereum, there's a lot of decentralized exchanges, also known as a DEX. A DEX is basically a, an exchange where all the trades and orders are entirely controlled by a smart contract. So, an example of a DEX on Ethereum is Ether Delta, and we actually saw evidence of arbitrage behavior. So, if you look at the at the diagram on the right, you see that the top is the cells the bottom of the buys, and you see this price mismatch where the lowest price for the sell is higher than the highest highest price for the buy. So we can see that a trader's taking advantage of of, um, of an opportunity can make an instant profit. However, the important key factor here is that both trades have to have to execute successfully, and so we expect that traders would, re would be required to create some sort of gadget or some sort of gadget contract to implement these two trades. And that's exactly what we find, where we see that these these um, arbitrages actually have a gadget contract. They all have to implement well. They all have to like implement one 
and essentially the implementation is, is relatively straightforward. They do a lot of validation. They do a lot of check on trades because who wants to submit a transaction? You don't really know when the trade is going to get executed on the chain. And so, and so there's actually a lot of heavy validation, actually heavy validation, and it actually costs a lot of gas as well. And we've actually, and we finally found that they implement these atomic batch trades and exactly how they implement them kind of changes from contract to contract, but by and large, they take advantage of this EVM hop called called revert, meaning if any of the trades fail, they can undo all state changes in, in the transaction. All contract state changes are reverted, and the transaction um, ends execution. So finally, we also looked at the game at the time called CryptoKitties. So this is essentially a um, trading game, trading game where there are cats who have some sort of uh, you know cute-looking physical attributes, also also called cat attributes, where where um, <laughs> Where everyone can can create a cat and trade them and have them up for auction, right? So what we can see here is that some cats have been up up for auction at the time for about 100, you know, 200 ETH, some for 350 ETH, which at the time is around 160 thousand um, dollars. Now these are only actually you know cats up for sale, although although we have seen cats sold for around 60 thousand dollars at the time. So it's you know this is this is quite a large large and important game on the network. So as you'd expect, you know, almost all the code is uh, publicly sourced. Um, you can see exactly how the auctions work, how the, how the game mechanisms work. However, there's one extremely crucial code, code piece that is kept intentionally opaque, right? So you can see they've called it a super secret gene algorithm. And so this algorithm can combine two cats whose genes are, um, are already known and actually create a new cat whose genes are somewhat randomized. And so this is kept intentionally opaque to hide functionality in case you know someone can discover it and actually gain the system. So you know it's actually so serious that people who actually develop de develop on the game and the algorithm are not even allowed to take part in the game. So obviously, right, this meant that this is a huge target for reverse engineering, and so we had to go and do it. Right. So actually, so we actually found out how the the block hatch is actually used in an extremely interesting way to inject random mutations into genes and actually how the parent genes are selected. Um, we actually did find a more informed breeding strategy to, that allows you to search for new cats, new, new cats that are more rare and will go for a lot more money. I'm not going to um, spoil the entire alg the algorithm here, although it is there in the paper. If you're interested, you can talk to me afterwards. I, I can kind of you know give you some hints how to make money. Um, and if, Finally, right, it's obvious in this case where you can't really rely on, on obscurity. Even though you have these opaque bytecode contracts, it's really um, infeasible to rely on that opacity to hide any kind of important functionality. As we see in this case, you know, they're readily reverse engineerable. Actually, um, you can actually also f find the exact, uh, one, not the exact, although our own solidity solidity code implementation of this exact exact contract, the function output matches, and you can see exactly how it works. So in conclusion, we see that the if the Ermico system is largely opaque, um, you know, there's about 77.5% of the contracts are unique are uniquely opaque. Or sorry, 77.5 of the unique contracts are opaque. Um, if you're interested in seeing the code, it's available there. Um, you can contact that email address and you know get more information. And finally, we've, less, we've actually seen how this opacity can be opacity assumption can be completely um, you know completely broken essentially through our case studies by seeing the high value wallets that we saw, the user exchange wallets, the arbitrage bots, and the CryptoKitties gene algorithm. And that's our talk. So thank you. I have like questions now. Hi, um, yeah, Johannes from the previous, previous, previous talk. Um, I have a question about your assignment of, of registers to um, stack uh, locations. Oh, because I believe open. there are some algorithms that actually use the stack structure. Yeah. So you can enter the same basic block if, in, in different uh, stack uh, states. Right, you're, you're exactly right. So actually, I oversimplified here a lot. Like, 
So one, heur one very important heuristic here is the internal call identification. So we identif so the block being reused multiple times is largely due to internal functions. So in that particular case, it will have multiple stack sizes. Uh, but if we extract the internal function, we can remove the, the, uh, the need to, to, to handle that case. So if anything left, uh, well, uh, well, if some block is left afterwards, still have multiple sizes, uh, we would duplicate it multiple times for each unique stack height. And yeah, that's a very good, good question. No, thanks. No more questions? All right, let's thank the speaker one more time then.